Please welcome to the stage the chairman of the board for the Cleveland Arts Prize, Howard Friedman. Thanks so much. Good evening. Thank you for being part of the 59th annual awards ceremony for the Cleveland Arts Prize. This evening we celebrate the achievements of a group of people who believe in the power of the arts to transform lives, not just their own, but all of ours. Yet as important as it is to recognize the 2019 winners of the Cleveland Arts Prize, there is something else we would like to do first. We need to take time to honor some of the transformative artists who are no longer with us physically, but who uh, remain with us through the spirit of their work. The presentation you are about to view commemorates arts champions who have passed on. And as you view, please listen closely to some of the budding artists who are part of the Contemporary Youth Orchestra. They are led by 2016 Cleveland Arts Prize winner Liza Grossman. Thank you for being here and enjoy the evening.
Thank you very much. I want to start with a special thank you for Liza Grossman and the Contemporary Youth Orchestra for accompanying the In Memoriam tribute. It was a beautiful piece. And thanks again to the Karamu House for relaunching the evening with a joyous second line parade. We borrowed that popular tradition this evening for a great way to kick off our celebration of the Cleveland Arts Prize 2019 winners. And thank you all for being here for that celebration. I'm Dee Perry, and I am really glad that we can be here together for this 59th annual award ceremony. It's my great pleasure to be your host this evening. I spent an entire broadcasting career celebrating artists of all kinds, and it's still one of my favorite things to do. My deep appreciation for the arts goes back a long way, even longer than 59 years. I really can't remember a time when I wasn't learning something from the creations of artists. The lesson started when I was just out of diapers and toddling around my grandmother's house. I used to watch her make magic with her hands, crocheting lacy doilies and turning weathered strips of clothes into colorful family quilts. My favorite thing, though, was her lamps. Grandma collected ornate cut glass lamps with dangling pendants, and she arranged them on top of the buffet in the dining room so that when the sun came streaming through the windows, it would turn the pendants into prisms and fill the room with rainbows. I would walk around the dining room, touching the walls so I could hold the rainbows in my hands. My grandma used to use those creations of the lamp makers in a way that was uniquely her own, and as I watched her daily light show, I was filled with awe. I remembered that feeling, that childhood sense of wonder, decades later, when I was standing in front of dazzling works on view at the Toledo and the Corning Glass Museums. My mom and dad also contributed to my sense that the arts were supposed to be a part of everyday life. By profession, my dad was a firefighter. By desire and study, he was a gifted painter of watercolors. He sat at the big table in our dining room, copying photos from magazines by drawing them first in pencil, then in vibrant colors from his paint set. He hung his drawings and later his sensitive black and white photographs on the walls, and I examined them closely, studying his technique as I would study the works of professional visual artists many years later. My mom instilled in me a love of language, first by reading out loud to me, and then filling the house with books of all kinds for me to discover on my own. I also studied her voice and the way she used it. People who've complimented my speaking voice are really complimenting hers. My mother's own personal artistic expression was singing. Some of my warmest, fuzziest memories are of sitting in the living room reading a book while she puttered in the kitchen, crooning quietly to herself, or so she thought. I could still hear her voice. Once I had a secret love that lived within the heart of me. I'm sure I'm not the only one who lived with or knew people who had tremendous artistic talent, but who for a variety of reasons couldn't or wouldn't express those talents publicly. That's why tonight is such a special celebration. It isn't easy to live life as a committed artist, to take your secret love and share it with the world. Sometimes the world doesn't understand your work. Sometimes it doesn't even seem to care. But the world does need artists. It needs the poets who expose their own hearts and help others to see the truth. It needs the dancers and choreographers who defy gravity and remind us what elegance looks like. The writers and theater makers who tell stories that help us to see ourselves and the world more clearly. It also needs the visual artists who wrestle earthbound materials into soaring works of art. And the world needs the individuals and the groups who provide support, showcases, and encouragement for the makers of art. Thanks to all of you for making sure your secret love's no secret anymore. 
And now, to begin the presentation of this evening's awards is a 2010 winner of the Martha Joseph Prize, Joanne Cohen. The Martha Joseph Prize was created to celebrate the work of individuals and organizations who have shown extraordinary commitment to supporting the strength and vitality of arts in Northeast Ohio. Over the past 100 years, the Cleveland Print Club has demonstrated that level of commitment in many ways. Since the Print Club's founding in 1919, its members have gifted the Cleveland Museum of Art, and by extension, our whole community, with thousands of remarkable artworks. They've also carried the banner for education and print make, about printmaking history and created opportunities to showcase fine art prints for individual collectors. So many homes in Cleveland are distinctive due to the prints they collected, compliments of their involvement in the Print Club. It is my pleasure to present the Martha Joseph Prize to the Print Club of Cleveland. Accepting the award is Jennifer Leach, the Print Club of Cleveland President and Margaret Dobbins, Centennial Committee Chair. Thank you. The Print Club is celebrating its centennial this year. I'm Margaret Dobbins, and I'm here with Jennifer because I chair the Centennial Committee. The club has spent the year celebrating its 100-year history with special programming, sponsorships, and publications. To highlight just three events from this very full calendar, in collaboration with the Cleveland Museum of Art, the club produced this beautiful <laughs> full-color book showcasing 100 years of publication prints and significant gifts to the museum. Incidentally, this year's <clears throat> Cleveland Arts Prize special honoree, John Pearson, was the publication print artist in 1984 with his image, Circle Series Invert PC. <clears throat> The club, secondly, the club sponsored the spectacular recent show in the print galleries, Lasting Impressions, Gifts of the Print Club. And lastly, on October 12th, the club is sponsoring a lecture here, free and open to the public, about Michelangelo, his drawings, and how his approach compared to that of his contemporaries. Let me just say that receiving the Martha Joseph Prize in this centennial year is truly the icing on the cake. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you, Margaret and Joanne. Um, good evening, I'm Jennifer Leach, and I have the honor of serving as the current president of the Print Club of Cleveland. Receiving the Martha Joseph Prize is not about any one individual member of the Print Club. It's about every current member of the club and every member over the past 100 years. The club's mission has always been to stimulate interest in and appreciation of old and contemporary prints to encourage private collecting of prints by individuals and to support the print collection and print department of the Cleveland Museum of Art. We achieve our mission through programming events such as visiting artist studios, museums, and private collections, and art talks with our esteemed curators here at CMA. We commission an artist annually to create a fine art print that is distributed to every member of the club and we invite print dealers from around the country to participate in the yearly fine print fair held here at the CMA atrium, and that's open to the public. The members of the print club have a common interest in fine art prints, and as a result, many lasting friendships have been forged, and much fun has been had in pursuing our interest while also being an asset to the Cleveland art community. Being awarded the Cleveland Arts Prize is truly an honor for us, especially in our centennial year. We thank you for including us among the excellent artists and organizations who have won the prize over the years. I am proud to accept the Martha Joseph Prize on behalf of the members of the Print Club of Cleveland, the members of the past, the present, and the future. So thank you. Congratulations to the Print Club of Cleveland. Coming to the stage now 
is 2013 Cleveland Arts Prize winner and 2019 Literature Juror, Douglas Max Utter, to introduce Emerging Artist winner, Keisha Nicole Foster. Good evening, everybody. Glad to be here. From the time she was a little girl, Keisha Nicole Foster was captivated by the power and possibilities revealed in the, in the words of writers. As a teenager, Keisha be, began to captivate audiences with her own words, both as a writer and a performer of poetry. In a relatively short time, Keisha's skills and experience grew to the point that she became recognized as a fierce competitor and an award winner in local, regional, and national slam poetry competitions. Even with those on stage successes, however, she never set aside her belief in the transformative power of the written word. She has shared her words in two acclaimed books of poetry, and she is currently working on a third collection. As a mentor, coach, and an empathetic listener, she has encouraged others to share their voices and stories. I am very honored to present the Cleveland Arts Prize Emerging Artist Award to Kisha Nicole Foster. Thank you so much. <laughs> Poetry was not my first choice as a career. I fell into writing poems by way of not being able to talk about my emotions. When I would share with my close friends and family, they would barely listen for no other reason except I'm Keisha, so. I am humbled and honored to accept this most distinguished award, which was started by the Women's Club because I am humbled and honored to do the work as poet. I have had great mentors, professors, good people that made sure I knew all accolades without the work is not the business. So I do this work, creating lines, building up people, making meetings, sometimes late, yet I make them. <laughs> I show up. Regardless to whom or what I show up, I go through, I speak plain, I ask questions, brave storms, let the rain pour, I give in. I allow life to happen. I give myself permission to be human. Character flaws and all. I want to accept this award on behalf of Christopher Drame, also known as Vertigo, Nikki Delamotte, Dwayne Gork Piggy, and Tasha Houston. Four creative energies that I adored and gave me pieces of their lives that I cherish. I want to dedicate this night to my father, Henry Hammond, for the motivation behind my book, Blood Work, for his height, that is my shadow, and to my mother, Shirley Hammond, who is the strength of my spine, who gifted me her laughter and her kindness, her willingness to keep it moving, good, bad, or ugly. Thank you. Congratulations to Keisha Nicole Foster. Joining us next is 2012 Cleveland Arts Prize winner, Bill Wade, to introduce a member of the Inlet Dance Team, emerging artist winner, Dominic Moore Dunson.
Good evening. I first met Dominic Moore Dunson about 10 years ago when he joined the Inlet Training and Apprentice Program. He advanced through the program and the company ranks very quickly. It was immediately clear he had much more to offer than his desire and ability to perform at a high level. <clears throat> Dominic had and has a passion to perform and collaboratively create art that not only makes a positive impact on audiences, but is also a vehicle for community change. Dominic's hard work ethic, his intellectual rigor in both his artistic practice and learning about arts and culture sec sector business, and his skills as an emerging choreographer have grown by leaps and bounds. In fact, he was very recently promoted to become assistant to the artistic director at Inlet Dance Theater. Several years ago, he came to realize that creating his own dance works would allow him to grow as an artist and bring the stories that are his to tell onto the stage. His first evening length dance theater work, The Black Card Project, was extremely well received, secured a top tier booking agent, and is poised for national attention and touring. In fact, while we are here at the Cleveland Arts Prize this evening, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation is presenting a Knight Arts Challenge Award for phase two of Dominic's production at their event right now at the Akron Art Museum. Dominic continues to grow as a dancer, as a choreographer, as a husband, as a community-focused leader, and a compassionate human being. It's a privilege to be his mentor, my honor, <laughs> to present the Arts Prize, Cleveland Arts Prize Emerging Artist Award in Dance to Dominic Moore Dunson. <laughs> So wow, okay. First I want to thank the Cleveland Arts Prize jurors, the board, and Alenka. Receiving this award is incredibly humbling, and I'm so grateful that you all believe that I belong a part of this prestigious group of artists. Thank you. I want to thank Bill Wade and all of Inlet Dance Theater, past and present. Like Bill said, over a decade, Bill's been mentoring me both inside and outside the studio. Bill, I want to thank you for continuously challenging me to dig deeper into myself as an artist and pull out the gifts that we both know can help people. This prize represents way too many 14 to 16 hour days we've had together, planning and executing this mission of using dancer for other people. I want to thank four very special women who are here with me tonight. My sister, Nikisha Moore Dunson, my mother, Elaine Moore, my grandmother, Viola Moore, and my wife, Ashley Moore Dunson. Behind every artist is a group of people who have sacrificed far and beyond what they've had to so that the artist could find their calling. For me, these four women, that's my group of people. I love you all very, very much. For me, this prize is a confirmation. It's a confirmation that a career in dance versus professional soccer was the right choice. <laughs> it's a confirmation that despite how I feel daily, I deserve to call myself an artist. And it's a confirmation that I chose the right place in this nation to start my artistic career. So on the way up here, driving from Akron, I was thinking to myself, what kind of advice or call to action could I give this group of people? The problem is, because of the caliber of the people in this room, I realized it's not very much. <laughs> but I did think to myself, maybe I could give us a reminder, something that's intuitive to all of us, but easy to forget. So here it is. Each one of us is the expert of our own personal experience. So let's remember to use our craft to tell our stories because we're experts of our own experience, we are storytellers with the purpose and the hope of changing other people's lives, not just our own. Thank you.
Congratulations to Dominic Moore Dunson. Coming to the stage next is Jules Belkin, winner of the 2015 Martha Joseph Prize, and his wife, Fran Belkin, to introduce the 2019 Robert P. Bergman winner, Terry Pontremoli. Um, I guess our family knows a little something about what it takes to put on a concert <laughs> and how much work in building a music festival. And we did it over 35 years. It was never easy, but we kept at it because we loved the music. The same can be said for Terry Pontremoli. Not an easy name. A love of music was part of her family's DNA. Her dad played jazz guitar on the weekends and encouraged his kids to study classical music. Terry and her sister Anita even performed together as a classical duo on violin and piano. Terry really found her calling as an administrator for the Tri-C Jazz Fest, joining them in 1990. Over the years, she did community outreach educational shows in school, as well as some fundraising and becoming an advocate for jazz. Terry first became Jazz Fest director in 2002, and then some years after some years away, she returned to the director's chair in 2011. Throughout her tenure, Terry has worked long and hard to support jazz education to introduce audiences of all ages to the joys of jazz and to, and to connect Jazz Fest with other arts organizations around the region. Under her leadership, Jazz Fest has become one of the premier downtown events, attracting thousands of people for the weekend. So it seems very fitting that we're here to see Terry receive a prize that rewards long-term dedication, inspiring a democratic vision of art. It is our pleasure to present the Robert P. Bergman Prize to Terry Pontremoli. What an honor, and especially to have Fran and Jules up here with me. Um, it is an honor to receive this prize, the Bergman Prize. Uh, Bob Bergman's years here um, were truly transformational. His energy and commitment to the arts made a profound and lasting inspiration on all of us. I'm humbled to be one of the distinguished recipients of this award in his name. It's no news to anyone that I love jazz. <laughs> The music, the musicians, the freedom, the joy. Um, in my mind, jazz represents what is best about us as Americans. Uh, it is such a privilege to present it, to collaborate with musicians, to commission new works, and to create one-of-a-kind shows that I just feel really blessed and happy to be able to do it. I have many people to thank. First, my family. Um, especially my mom and dad, who sacrificed a lot to support my musical training. We literally had thousands of trips to CIM back in the day. Uh, and for introducing me to jazz in the first place. To Jerry Sue Thornton and Alex Johnson and Cuyahoga Community College, which is such a perfect home for jazz in Cleveland for so many reasons. To Jules and Fran for your generosity and emotional support. This award is for all of us at Jazz Fest. Paul, Cliffy, Joel, Madeline, Orlando, Bill, Kyra, Anne, for marching into battle with me every day. And last but not least, Dominic Farinacci, one of my artistic partners in crime, and forever and always, Tommy LaPuma. Thank you.
I just want to say congratulations once again to Terry Pontremoli. Thank you so much for all you've done. In just a moment, we'll share the words of an Ohio-born author who became a towering figure in literature, but we begin at her beginning. She was born Chloe Anthony Wofford on February 18, 1931. A native daughter of Lorraine, Ohio, she graduated with honors from Lorraine High School, then went on to study English at Howard University. It was at Howard that she began to call herself Tony, an abbreviation of her middle name. Tony Wofford went next to Cornell University to obtain her master's degree. In 1958, she married Harold Morrison, and the world was first introduced to Toni Morrison. Under that name, she created an amazing body of work that was celebrated by critics, literary prizes, and countless numbers of devoted readers. In 1992, Toni Morrison's novel Jazz joined novels by two other African-American women novelists, Alice Walker and Terry McMillan, on the New York Times bestsellers list. Never before had three African-American authors been on the Times list concurrently. This was one of several firsts for the 1978 Cleveland Arts Prize recipient, who, in 1993, was also the first African-American woman to win a Nobel Prize for Literature and the first American woman to win the award since 1938. Over the decades, Toni Morrison would win many prestigious awards for her writing, but she was equally devoted to her role as an educator. She still has much to teach us about the history of our country, about the quest for self-knowledge, and both the inadequacy and the transcendent beauty of words. We share now the words of Toni Morrison from her first novel published in 1970, The Bluest Eye. Please welcome to the stage to read those words, 2011 Cleveland Arts Prize winner, Michael Oatman. to me, she is talking to the puke, but she's calling it my name, Claudia. She wipes it up as best she can and puts a scratchy towel over the large, wet place. I lie down again. The rags have fallen from the window crack and the air is cold. I dare not call her back and I am reluctant to leave my warmth. My mother's anger humiliates me. Her words chafe my cheeks and I am crying. I do not know what she, I do not know that she is not angry at me, but at my sickness. I believe she despises my weakness for letting the sickness take hold. By and by, I will not get sick. I will refuse to. But for now, I am crying. I know I am making more snot, but I can't stop. My sister comes in. Her eyes are full of sorrow. She sings to me. When the deep purple falls over sleepy garden walls. Someone thinks of me. I doze thinking of plums, walls, and someone. But was it really like that? As painful as I remember? Only mildly, or rather, it was a productive and fructifying pain. Love, thick and dark as alligator syrup, eased up into that cracked window. I could smell it, taste it sweet, musty, with an edge of winter green in its base, everywhere in that house. It struck along with my tongue to the frosted window panes. It coated my chest along with the salve, and when the flannel came undone in my sleep, the clear, sharp curves of air outlined its presence on my throat. And in the night, when my coffin was dry and tough, Feet padded into the room, hands repinned the flannel, readjusted the quilt, and rested a moment on my forehead. So when I think of autumn, I think of somebody with hands who do not want me to die.
Thank you to Michael Oatman. Joining us now is the winner of the 2010 Cleveland Arts Prize for Literature, David Giffels, to present the Mid-Career in Literature Award to Mary Bittinger. Good evening, I bring you glad tidings from Akron. The poems of my University of Akron colleague and friend, Mary Bittinger, have often been described in architectural terms, such as, quote, scaffolded like a twisting stairway or a maze-like hall. What the reviewers are getting at is that Mary's words lead to unexpected places in ex unexpected ways. In a Bittinger poem, you may find yourself holding on for dear life at the end of one of her lines, only to realize that you must let go and drop to the next. She writes like a force of nature, think gravity. The weight of her talent and vision pulls you into her orbit. That same force also pulls at the internal structure of her work, breaking images apart and letting words plummet as if they were loose bricks on a falling down house. There we are, back to architecture again. Mary's talent, though, lies not just in the structure of her work, but in its content. She has a way of making her poetic narrator a kind of magic mirror that reflects back to us our own feelings of confusion, disillusion, and fragile hope. Mary has written six acclaimed collections of poetry, including a just-released book of poems titled, prose poems titled Partial Genius. She has been recognized nationally as a selfless champion of poetry, leading a charge to save the University of Akron Press and its celebrated Akron series in poetry from the ravages of university budget cuts. She is also a generous colleague and a wonderful friend. And it is a terrific pleasure to see her talent celebrated this evening with the presentation of the Cleveland Arts Prize Mid-Career Award to Mary Bittinger. the right hairstyle for this, but I'm going to make it work. <laughs> In my poetry, I strive to represent the experiences and voices of underdogs, oddballs, ghosts, introverts, and maybe even losers. For this reason, the Cleveland Arts Prize is an even greater honor. Thank you so much to David for the generous remarks, to the award jurors for their consideration, to Alenka for her leadership and advocacy, and to the Cleveland Arts Prize and its generous benefactors. Many thanks to my fellow award recipients who have gone from names faintly recognized to new friends. The most gratitude goes to my family, especially Eric, who is featured in that wonderful photo. Thanks for taking that. For unwavering enthusiasm and support and taking care of those children and all those pets. Finally, I would like to send an extra shout out to Keisha and Dominic, who make me so hopeful about the future of the arts in our region. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations to Mary Bittinger. Coming to the stage next is the winner of the Cleveland Arts Prize 2009 Martha Joseph Prize, Charles Fee. Thanks everybody. It's, uh, it's such a thrill and so great to be here among all of uh, these incredible artists and, uh, and oddballs for sure. Um, so thanks for having me back, everybody. When I arrived in Cleveland in 2002 to join Great Lakes Theater, 
my very first meeting was with Victoria Bussert. She was already uh, legendary in our company. She had held virtually every artistic title that we have in our company. And that's a very unusual thing. Uh, she'd been with us since the mid-1980s. She joined the company as the child wrangler on one of our new musicals. Um, anyone who's been a child wrangler in the audience, you know it's a tough job. She's still child wrangling, by the way. Uh, she went on to be director, casting director, associate artistic director, ultimately the interim artistic director for a year. And through all of it, um, I believe her child wrangling skills came in well. She became ultimately what we now call her the adult wrangler. <laughs> when we met, uh, we were getting together actually to talk about Baldwin Wallace University. I'd never heard of a BW at that point, and she was there to instruct me about it and the work that she was doing with young artists in the musical theater program. I was looking for understudies. Vicky had completely different plans for us. We hatched at that meeting uh, a plan together discussing the works of Shakespeare and how similar they are to American musicals and musicals in general. Large cast, large canvas plays, poetry and lyrics, solos and soliloquies, dances and fights and that they would be the perfect American theater if you could have a single company of actors capable of being in both forms. 17 years later, this week, we're opening The Music Man, directed by Victoria Bussert, and Julius Caesar, directed by Sarah Bruner. We have an acting company of 23 actors, all of them in both plays, and of those 23 actors, 16 of them are former or, cur or current students of Vicki Bussert's. Um, I would say that she has staged a coup over our company, uh, it only took her 17 years, but she has made an incredible impact on all of our work and our lives. Her impact at BW is equally, if not more, remarkable. Last year, On Stage Magazine ranked Baldwin Wallace Musical Theater Program as the number one music theater program in the country. That is remarkable. Yes, that's right. If you were lucky enough this morning, as I was, to turn on WCPN, I just happened to turn it on, and here were two of Vicky's great students, Warren Egypt Franklin, who's touring currently on the national tour of Hamilton, and one of her young students, Gordy Hayes, who is tonight on stage in Kinky Boots at Baldwin Wallace at this very moment, I'm sure. And both of them were on the radio to talk about the transformation that they experienced at Baldwin Wallace and with Vicki Bussert as a director. Their lives have been changed forever, as our companies have, certainly. Vicki directs in at least two of our companies every single year. She directs locally, regionally, internationally. She directs at school and professionally. But every week, she's with those students, training them to be great artists. And most of them go on to professional careers, which in our work is nearly unheard of. I am so thrilled to present the Cleveland Arts Prize to a true mid-career <laughs> recipient. This is what we call mid-career, the perfect time of life. Victoria Busser, thank you, my friend. Uh, thank you so much. You know, when I, the first undergrad school I went to, I was there the first day and I, I went to the head of the theater department. I said, I'm so excited to be here. I want to be a director. And he said, you can't. Um, women aren't directors. You can be an acting major, but you can't major in directing. And so I transferred to an all women's college. <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, when I, I came to Cleveland 33 years ago on a six-week contract as a child wrangler, um, which prepared me to be a teacher, uh, I fell in love with Cleveland, and Cleveland said the exact opposite thing to me. It said, yes, come here, you can be a director. And over my 33-year love affair with this city, I've had the honor of directing at Kane Park, 
the Cleveland Playhouse, Beck Center for the Arts, Dabama Theater, the Cleveland Opera, Playhouse Square, just recently the Cleveland Orchestra at Blossom, and my longtime artistic home, Great Lakes Theater. Um, ten years into my time in Cleveland, I was fortunate enough to join the faculty of Baldwin Wallace College, now Baldwin Wallace University, where I was supported in the effort to combine my professional life with the world of academia in order to create a hybrid program. I am so grateful to be here tonight, but as a director, I am nothing but a collaborator, and I need to thank these very important collaborators I've had in my life. Janet Barlow, the former managing director of Kane Park, Scott Spence, the artistic director of Beck Center, Gina Vernacci and David Green at Playhouse Square, artistic directors Jerry Friedman, who is really my second dad, and Charlie Fee, who decided it was okay to keep me on um, in my longtime artistic home. I also just want to recognize some of the artists that I get to collaborate with. Designers Jeff Herman and Russ Borsky, music directors Nancy Meyer and Matt Webb, choreographers Greg Daniels and Jackie Miller, the Baldwin Wallace University, uh, everybody who works there, but especially I've had such an incredible time with the presidents who I've served under. President Neil Malachy, Dick Durst and Bob Helmer, the Dean of the Music Conservatory, Susan Van Voorst, um, the Baldwin Wallace board member, Beth Swales, who really created the music theater program, my colleagues, Scott Plate and Brian Bowser, and my constantly challenging and inspiring students. Lastly, I am blessed to share my life with my own brilliant music director, my husband, Dale Reeling. Somehow our deep love for this art form and one another has made our two house, two city, one dog partnership work for 15 years. There is nothing more meaningful to me than to be recognized by such outstanding peers. I am deeply grateful and humbled I am deeply grateful to everyone associated with the Cleveland Arts Prize. Thank you for this incredible honor. Congratulations to Victoria Bussert. Very shortly, we'll hear from this evening's special honoree, visual artist John Pearson. First, though, we'll meet him through the lens of filmmaker Ted Sikora. This painting has is, is got a series of arcs that move in this direction and that direction, but so that, that they, all, they all pivot right onto this point, so it's like they fan out, but they also come back together right along this horizontal. So that's one kind of opening and folding energy. I was reading an article today in the paper by one of those New York critics, and she seemed to miss the point that art is not about media, it's about ideas. I was trained as a figure painter, that's why I managed to get into the academy in London. I was not particularly interested in the figure, that was more or less a test of motor skills. The easiest thing in the world to do is to paint a still life group, to set in front of something that you just copy, one wants to transcend just copying, you want to make it do something else. That something else is very difficult to define and describe, but that's what I think art is. I was more interested in trying to create what I think a work of art creates. There's a sense of magic about a work of art. It creates a, a compelling experience that is actually extremely difficult to describe. And I don't think I've read anything by any critic that really manages to communicate what I think a work of art really does. I think the thing that stimulates me most is actually walking in the landscape. I'm not trying to paint landscapes or make things look like landscapes, but there is an experience that I have in landscape, whether it's when I've been in Japan, there has been certain situations where the experience has been overwhelming. I might even use the term spiritual, although I'm not quite sure what that means. I want the work that I do to have that kind of presence. You can teach the language, but you cannot um, teach people what to say.
Now, joining us on stage to introduce this evening's special honoree is the winner of the 2011 Cleveland Arts Prize for Design and Cleveland Arts Prize Emeritus Trustee, Robert Mashkey. One of the things <clears throat> that is so compelling about the works of painter John Pearson is how he has been able to take the precision of mathematics and use it as one of his tools as an artist. John's work showcases the inherent beauty of forms through straight lines, sharp angles, and looping curves. He then enhances that beauty by saturating it with color. The use of digital technology and mathematical formulas to create artificial restrictions seems to have a converse effect in the hands of an artist like John Pearson. That is, instead of curtailing his creativity, the limits he has put in place have resulted in works that stimulate the senses in remarkable ways. Stripped of any conversation on the canvas, but the one that exists between shape and color, John creates a deeply artistic dialogue. It is a dialogue that has evolved throughout his life as an artist, and one that we hope will continue to, as he puts it, slowly seduce. I am so fortunate to call John a dear friend, and as a friend I have to add how fortunate that with John came Audra. The two were inseparable. This last photo really shares how unique they were together. She is greatly missed. <clears throat> John Pearson received the Cleveland Arts Prize for Visual Art in 1975, and now it is my great honor to present my good friend with an award tonight as an Arts Prize Special Honoree. Accepting tonight for John is his son, Jason Pearson. Thank you, Robert. My father is here. He's in the front row, but he said before we arrived this evening, I don't really have to say anything tonight, do I? Which is why I'm up here in his stead, and I'll hand him the award when I get down there. But I did want to say a few words on behalf of our family to the Cleveland arts community, because we are so deeply, deeply grateful to all of you, many of whom were with us when we celebrated my mother earlier this year after her passing. And we are grateful to you as a community of artists and supporters of the arts, and simply as a community that supports, has supported us as a family for years. My first memories, my three-year-old daughter is here in the audience, and I'm glad that some of her first memories are of this museum. Some of my first memories are of the banister rail at the old New Gallery of Contemporary Art, which is now the Museum of Contemporary Art. And, um, and we really grew up as a family in this community. And as I hope some of you will read the text that we prepared as a family in the program that attests to how we feel about this city as a city that, as several of the other awardees, truly welcomes everyone here and celebrates the differences among us and builds community out of that. We need places like this and we need places like Cleveland today and we are so grateful as part of this community to have been able to, be, been able to be a part of it and we thank you and we'd like you to celebrate one another with applause at this moment, so thank you. Thank you, Jason Pearson, and congratulations to John Pearson. Now coming to the stage to introduce this year's Lifetime Achievement Award is the president of Kent State University, Todd Dykin. Thank you so much, and uh, congratulations to all the award winners tonight. All four seasons in one day. All four seasons in one day. Now, we hear some variation of that quip a lot in Northeast Ohio. <laughs> sort of, if you don't like the weather, stick around, it'll change. Or literally all four seasons in one day, we get it in Northeast Ohio. 
Well, I literally get to see all four seasons in one day. It's on the wall in my office as the president of Kent State University. It's a beautiful piece. It's made of cotton and of linen and of copper wire. And this morning, as I was watching and looking at all four seasons in one day, I was noticing it about 7.30 this morning when the early autumn sun was coming in the window. And then I watched all four seasons in one day as the sun progressed through noon, through 4 o'clock this afternoon. It is, of course, a wonderful piece by Professor Janice Lesman Moss. And you know, I say often on campus and off campus some sort of observation about the fact that there are many great universities in the United States and in the world, and there are some of those universities that have either no art departments, no art, art programming, or very little art programming. And they're great universities nonetheless, but they would not be the university at which I would wish to serve. And so then I typically say something about art feeding the soul. But then as I was thinking about all four seasons in one day, I began to think that it's something more than that. It's really something like this, that people like Professor Janice Lesman Moss help us to see things differently. And it's really that power of helping us see things differently that is so wonderful, particularly in a period in our nation where seeing things differently would be a good thing. And so it really gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Janice Lesman Moss, winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you, President Dykin, and thank you all. Like most of you sitting here tonight, I believe that life holds many surprises and many rewards if you remain attentive, curious, persistent, and maybe a little patient. In pursuit of the things I love, I have worked hard, sought and accepted every opportunity, and always remained positive knowing that belief and trust are the best guiding principles. And here I am today, along with an amazing cohort of winners, accepting this wonderful honor from the Cleveland Arts Prize. Some seminal events that launched me on my career in art came in the mid-1970s, when I serendipitously got a job as a gallery assistant at the King Picture Gallery for Contemporary Art in Pittsburgh, a wonderful gallery right up the, the street from the Carnegie Museum. I learned then that artists were actually living, breathing, amazingly talented human beings dedicated to making meaning through their visual practice. Attending night classes in art at the University of Pittsburgh, I met my soon-to-be husband, Al Moss, an aspiring artist and musician who joined me in defining our journey of creative discovery together. In 1977, we moved to Philadelphia to attend the Tyler School of Art, where, out of curiosity, I took a course in textile art. I found myself immersed in a language of constructed order, manipulating threads to release metaphors in making. I had discovered my artistic voice and my life's passion. After receiving my MFA from the University of Michigan, I joined the faculty in the School of Art at Kent State University in 1981. Moving to Northeast Ohio, uh, we felt right at home in this culturally rich community. I know many of you will join me in proclaiming the elusiveness of time. We mark it in many ways as it moves 
on its systematic progression. As I embark on my 38th year as professor and head of the textiles program, I continue to find joy and fulfillment in the challenges and possibilities in teaching in the stimulating environment at Kent. And in my experiences there, I have had the pleasure of sharing in the lives and careers of many talented students, colleagues, and alumni who continue to inspire me. My work in weaving has continued to evolve as I am dedicated to mining this unique language to unleash, unleash new ways to create beauty and meaning. Early on in my career as an artist and educator, I relished the manual engagement a weaver experiences with materials on the loom, orchestrating threads by hand to create woven compositions. And as digital options appeared, I became an advocate of computer-assisted looms. Around 1998, I was intrigued by reports of a new digital jacquard loom for hand weaving. Immediately, I submitted a request to the university to purchase one of these state-of-the-art tools. I wanted our students to have as many choices as possible to enhance their creative ideas and professional opportunities. And after several years of making this request, a fortuitous opportunity presented by the fashion school made my wish a reality. In 2001, we became one of the first textile art programs in the United States and the world to have one of these amazing looms. That was a momentous event for our program and for me personally as an artist. Digital design links seamlessly with weaving as they are both based in binary systems. That connection has allowed me to move forward with my work in ways that I would never have dreamed possible. Combining the generative potential of the computer with the electronic control of the loom and hand-dyed threads of varied texture and weight gives me innumerable design options while still allowing me to remain attentively involved in the construction of the weaving on the loom. I map fields of pattern that I hope will ultimately provide a rich visual and poetic experiences, experience for viewers of my work. How privileged I feel to have led the life I have thus far. Being recognized and rewarded for doing the work I love to do making my weavings, serving as a teacher and mentor to interested students, and spreading the gospel of weaving to whoever will listen. I am grateful to the Cleveland Arts Prize organization for its visionary work, and to Alenka Banco for her leadership. My nominator, Rebecca Cross, has been steadfast in her belief in me, and I want to thank her from the bottom of my heart. I know this Lifetime Achievement Award will propel me as I seek additional life achievements. I leave you with some lyrics from one of my husband's songs. Life is a story of accidents. Some hurt like hell, some are heaven sent. Ah, but save a place for me in line between the right ahead and the left behind. Thank you. Congratulations to Janice Lesman Moss. Joining us next on stage are the co-chairs of the Cleveland Arts Prize Burge Fellowship, Daniel Gray Contar, Executive Artistic Director of 12 Literary Arts, and Grafton Nunes, President and CEO of the Cleveland Institute of Art. Good evening. As chair of the Verge Fellowship, I'm proud to introduce this next award with my friend and co-chair Grafton. 
Uh, a little over two years ago, the Cleveland Arts Prize launched the Verge Fellowship, and even the name uh, from the beginning that first year evolved. This award is for artists who are on the verge, on the verge of discovery, a new body of work, a new technique, or the next stage of their development as artists. It was intentionally fluid in order to allow it change as was needed. And so the Verge Fellowship represents the next generation of artistic excellence, but also in a broader sense, Verge represents what some call research and development of arts and culture in our communities. Verge mirrors the complexity of our world today, of our communities. And so let me say that I am proud to be here today for the obvious reason, to celebrate new emerging talent, but also because as a society we must lean into discomfort to find beauty. We must embrace that discomfort for true insight and inspiration. And Verge is intended to evolve into what it's supposed to become. Thank you, Daniel. We stand here today as evidence that we need to push the boundaries. Verge is nascent and represents a, 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 an emerging talented cohort that with support and with encouragement will inevitably expand and have increasing impact on the arts community. For that, we should all strive. The Cleveland Arts Prize launched the Verge Fellowship in partnership with the Cleveland Foundation and this year with, a special, with special support for artist, uh, artist grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, it was able to increase the fellowship amount to $2,500 and double its impact from five to 10 artists across multiple disciplines. So, Let's get Cleveland's artists who are on the verge to the stage. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce the artists on The Verge. Brittany Benton. <laughs> Ephraim Butler. Archie Green II. Lexi Lattimore. Samuel McIntosh. Ryan Raymer. Nate Sturdivant. Antoine Washington. Mariama White and McKinley Wiley. Congratulations once again. Thank you all so much.
Opium Griswold. Coming to the stage now is the first recipient in 2018 of the Barbara S. Robinson Prize, Dr. William Griswold. Good evening, thank you, thanks Dee. Uh, in, uh, in 2018, the Cleveland Arts Prize announced that each year it would award a new Barbara S. Robinson Prize to an individual or an organization that has demonstrated an extraordinary commitment to advancing the arts through leadership in public policy, in legislation, in arts education, and in community development. Uh, I was humbled to be the inaugural recipient of that award, and this evening I am no less honored to present the 2019 prize. This year's recipient embraced the theater scene in Cleveland in the early 1990s, becoming an acclaimed actor and director in many of our region's most beloved theatrical spaces. He also displayed a gift for leadership and administration, serving as director of arts education for Cleveland's public schools and as artistic director for the Cleveland School of the Arts. But in 2015, he left his secure position with the schools to leap into the unknown. Tony Sias had agreed to become president and CEO of Karamu House, a 100-year-old theater with a rich artistic legacy but an uncertain future. In Tony's mind, it was important that he take the risk in order that he might invest everything that he had learned into the future of a place that he felt still had so much to offer. Karamu House is a national treasure and Tony's dynamic leadership and exciting vision for the future have galvanized the arts community. And if I may add a personal note, he is a true collaborator and a committed partner for whom we at the CMA are immensely grateful. There have been many measures of Tony's success over the past four years, and I am here to offer yet another. It is my privilege to present the 2019 Barbara S. Robinson Prize to Tony F. Sias. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bill, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. To be the second person to receive this award following Bill Griswold, I am convinced I am doing something right. <laughs> it is with great joy and appreciation that I received the Barbara S. Robinson Cleveland Arts Prize Award. Barbara, your service to art and culture has had a deep and lasting impact on the state of Ohio and beyond. Thank you for your steadfast, unwavering commitment to this community and to this country as an artist, arts advocate, and innovative strategic thought leader. Thank you. My appointment to Kara Muhaus is the culmination of over 25 years of advancement in the arts. Being chosen to lead this institution at this seminal moment in its history is a divine appointment for which I am grateful. Throughout my career, I have focused on impact. Whether advocating for quality arts education on the local or national level, mentoring student artists to find their authentic voices, directing professional actors on the stage, or redirect, redirecting and elevating an iconic legacy institution. Meaningful results have been my focus and goal. So tonight I accept this award on behalf of my mother, Helen Walker Sias, who taught home economics and child development for 34 years. 
My five siblings and I never forgot the lessons we learned about community involvement and the importance of arts by watching mother direct the dance ensemble, run the school theater program, and even producing and directing the local debutante's cotillion. <laughs> she, used the, she used the arts as a vehicle for convening communities, bringing families together, and inspiring young people, most often from disenfranchised communities, to do something with their lives. An impeccable woman of strength, courage, and wisdom. I am because she was. In fact, I tell people, don't take a photo of my face. Take one of my feet, because I stand upon many, many mighty shoulders as I, as I work to remain impactful while fulfilling this assignment. Thank you. Congratulations to Tony Sias, and congratulations to all of the 2019 winners of the Cleveland Arts Prize. And now, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage a woman who's made living her life a work of art, the executive director of the Cleveland Arts Prize, Alenka Banco Glazen. <laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I really hope that you enjoyed the program. And I think for the first time uh, since I've been part of the Cleveland Arts Prize, we've actually are going to finish early. <laughs> so I know we were worried about getting people out of the parking lot, so I don't think we'll have to worry about that tonight. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who presented tonight um, and performed. Uh, Dee Perry, uh, who's very special to the Cleveland Arts Prize um, and to artists in Cleveland. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Kent State University School of Arts, DLR Group, Westlake Reed and Laskowski, Third Federal Foundation, and the Cleveland Museum of Art. Thank you, Director Griswold, and thanks to your staff for always making us feel like family. Thank you to the Cleveland Foundation and Cuyahoga Arts and Culture for your support and funding the Verge Fellowship. I'd like to thank the jurors past and present. Could I please ask you to stand up? The staff of the Cleveland Arts Prize uh, for a long time was one and a quarter. Um, now it's two. So the real work in selecting the winners, the commitment, the hours, the portfolio reviews, um, all my emails, um, is really the jurors. This organization is driven by the community and um, the people who really are committed to the arts in the city. Um, the other thing I'd really like to do is ask our past winners and current winners to stand up. I'd personally like to thank you for making Cleveland a more dynamic city. Um, we all sort of got our wish in the city of Cleveland. We wanted all these events to go to, and now we can't pick between six a night because there's so much going on. I'd like to thank the board of the Cleveland Arts Prize, past and present. Can I ask you to stand up as well? I know.
Your commitment to CAP resonates. Um, we're in our 59th year, and we are approaching 60, um, which I think is something to be really proud of. It's really a community-based and publicly driven organization, so I think it's a testament to all of you and to the city. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank all of you for your support. For everyone that's filled out a nomination over and over again, and for everyone who's uploaded their portfolio over and over again. Um, CAP is, is special because it really is sort of the umbrella of the arts. Um, we're not just a nonprofit, we actually represent every nonprofit. We represent every curator, every gallery, every museum. Um, our boundaries span from Akron, you know, Oberlin, uh, and Cleveland, obviously. But um, it's, it's really special, and I want to thank you all for your support. I just want to say what a great pleasure it's been being here immersed in creativity this evening. Thanks to all the artists and all the art supporters in this room who make it possible for all of us to make a, a more artful life. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening and make some art. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I feel like I forgot some, I forgot to thank my husband. <laughs>